It's an old preacher's trope that this story begins in a garden and ends in a garden. It begins in a garden filled with life, a garden of perfection, the garden of the first creation, the garden of God's loving purpose for us, a purpose we prefer ultimately to decide for ourselves. And it ends in a garden, a garden near a place of desertion and death, a garden where things grow near a place of execution. Tear back the comfort of that sweet old preacher's story, and we know with unblinking certainty what that second garden is. It's not a garden, it's a graveyard. It's not Eden, it's the emptiness of death and loss. It's not a place where things are planted, it's a place where the dead are buried. Maybe more than in any other year of our lives, this year, we know this place with a grim, absolute certainty. Last year, at this very moment, we were adjusting to the first disorienting weeks of confinement. We were realizing with growing discomfort that there was a disease stalking the whole world that was much worse than our inconveniences. Last Easter, we weren't even able to gather in our churches. By God's grace, this year, at least some of us can. Others of us are still at home. But no matter where we are, we've been changed. We have been changed by all we've seen and experienced. Since this all began, nearly three million people have died from this disease. 227,000 of those deaths have taken place in the nations of Europe that our church serves. More than half a million of those deaths have taken place in the United States. Western culture is elegantly talented at shielding us from the fact of mortality. So much of our cultural output for at least the last two generations has sought to deny the reality of death by fanciful stories about misguided spiritualism on the one hand, or by the glorification of violence on the other. But our culture has utterly failed in its effort to shield us from this reality. We have seen it all around us, and not just in the graveyards. Even worse, we've seen it in our streets, in our closed cities, in our empty shops, in our neighbor's lost jobs, in our children's closed schools, in the once-in-a-lifetime moments we couldn't be present for, in the morning we couldn't gather for. My sisters and brothers, a year after all this began, every one of us has fallen into a grave. A grave of fear, a grave of despair, a grave of loss, a grave of uncertainty. All of us, each of us. Mary Magdalene has fallen into a grave. She has not just lost a friend, not just lost a teacher, she's lost her hope. Before she had no dignity, as one of the people around Jesus, she had dignity. Before she was disrespected and degraded by the society around her, because of Jesus, she had purpose and presence. This man who had taught that all people are worth God's love, even her, even us, he had been taken from them and destroyed by the brutality of an authoritarian power. Everything she had believed in had been lost, even her ability to believe in herself. When you hear these words of Mary's from John's Gospel, you should hear the voice of a woman at the breaking point. You should hear the voice of a woman in a Rohingya refugee camp. You should hear the cry of a woman desperate for a lost child shot in the streets. You should hear the inconsolable screaming of a woman who suffers the abject abandonment 
of all the love she had ever known. Mary remains there by the empty grave while Peter and John run home. She's left utterly bereft. Jesus' grave is empty, but her grave, the grave of her hopes, is not. You can understand why she confronts those strangers in the tomb. They're not angels to her, they're thieves. And when she turns around, there's another stranger. She's angry. She thinks he's the gardener. She wants answers. She wants her hopes back. She wants her dignity back. She just wants to come out of her grave. What accomplishes that for Mary isn't a bright flash of light or a heavenly host of angels. What brings Mary back to life is just one word from the God who has loved her all along and loves her still. A single word that calls her out of that grave. Mary. And what happens? The next thing we know about that broken woman are these verbs. She went and she announced. She is alive again. Alive in possibility. Alive in hope. Alive in faith. Not in denial of death, but in defiance of it. Today is not just the church's Easter. Today is our Easter. Today, here, now, everywhere, not just in church, but in all our lives. Today is the day that the voice of the Lord who has loved us through all this trouble will come cutting through our desperation and fear, our uncertainty and loss, and bring us out of our graves and back to life again. Mary, Anne, Nat, Joyce, Sophie, Charlie, Thomas, Mark. Our Easter is Mary Magdalene's Easter. Not an abstract promise of life after death. Yes, yes, that, but not just that. Our Easter, this Easter, is an absolute, unyielding insistence on life before death, no matter what graves we make for ourselves. Today brings a call to each of us by name, from the God of love and the source of life, a call to the fullness and abundance of this life we have been given. That comes today. What will you do with that life? Will you come out of your grave? Are you willing? Are you ready? Will you go and announce? Will you seek and serve? Will you share and give thanks? All of it, all of it, I hope. But above all, even in this moment, even in this time of trial for us, it is our business to rejoice. Christ is raised, and so are we. Alleluia. Amen.